signing on, but I want to be. I know people are still signing on, but I want to be respectful of everybody's time and keep this on schedule. Welcome to our webinar, IRAC Wow. Our speakers today are Anat Hoffman, Executive Director of IRAC, and Orly Erev Lakovsky, the Director of IRAC. I won't spend time on their full bios. They are quite impressive, but you can read them in the registration emails. Jeff Agron is working the magic behind the scenes, and our interviewer today is Steve Portnoy. MRJ's media past president and MRJ's current executive director. So I'll, I'll pass it on to Steve to start the discussion. Steve. Thank you, Rob. And I'm just gonna very briefly, I want to thank advocate Orly Ezra Lichowski and Anat Hoffman for agreeing to participate in this webinar. I hope everyone will find it uh, useful, informative, entertaining and um, will consider supporting Iraq and the work that they do. So now I yield the screen. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, it's good evening here in Israel. I'm very happy to be uh, with all of you. Um, so um, I've been working at Iraq uh, for the past 18 years as a lawyer and it was very happy to step into the role of director of IRAC uh, just a few months ago. Um, and I wanna give you a taste of uh, some of the is issues we've been dealing with in the last years uh, in order, different struggles that we're leading in order to make uh, Israel a more just, tolerant and pluralistic society. Um, and I wanna start with the issue that we have been dealing with for um, almost two, two decades our fight against exclusion of women and gender segregation in the public sphere. Uh, we have identified this phenomenon at the beginning of the 2000s as a dangerous phenomenon, which tries to restrict women um, in the way women use the public sphere in different contexts. And we started to deal with this issue in the context of public transportation, specifically public buses, where women were ordered to board the bus from the back door and sit at the back of the bus and the front of the bus was reserved for men. And you know, for any American ear, it reminds of uh, um, black times, uh, very bleak times, um, you know, the, the last century. Uh, but for Israelis, you know, many Israelis did not understand why we had to deal with the issue and told us, you know, you should let the ultra-Orthodox uh, lead their way of life and respect uh, if they have a, a demand um, based on modesty to sit women and men separately on public buses. Uh, we did not accept it and took this case to court and a decade ago the Israeli Supreme Court accepted our petition and declared that gender segregation on public buses is illegal. Uh, what's interesting to note is that during this uh, struggle we received phone calls, anonymous phone calls from ultra-Orthodox women who told us that they thank God that there are reforms in the world that lead this kind of struggle because they themselves cannot allow uh, um, um, you know, an, an objection to this practice, which is considered a part of the ultra-Orthodox community. Uh, we continue to fight the different uh, demands for gender segregation in other contexts, for instance, in uh, the context of cemeteries and funerals. Uh, in Israel, um, cemeteries are run mostly by ultra-Orthodox burial companies, which oftentimes try to uh, force gender segregation on the mourning family and friends of the deceased, and sometimes even uh, prevent women from eulogizing their loved ones. Uh, they're, of course, creating very uh, um, tragic and sad experience for the mourning family. Uh, we helped uh, quite a few women sue the burial companies uh, for damages because this is illegal uh, and we've had quite a few uh, legal victories. Um, what's interesting to note is that for many years we've um, told the government that this practice is illegal and not only that it does not represent the majority of the ultra-orthodox but rather just a small radical part um, of this sector uh, and indeed uh, in 2013 after many years, the attorney general accepted many of our claims and issued a report that basically uh, said what we've been saying all along, saying that those practices are illegal and should not be allowed. Uh, we have been 
dealing with similar uh, demands in other contexts, for instance, a radio station, an ultra-Orthodox radio station, which was uh, uh, given a license by the state and did not allow any women to be heard on air at all. Um, not only singing, but also just speaking. Uh, we filed a civil suit for damage uh, against this radio station and won. And the station was ordered to pay 1 million shekels in damages and also ordered to have to allow women to be heard on air. And indeed, they now women are heard in the station. And um, not only that, just the people who listen to the station, the numbers just grew because it turned out that here as well, it's not that the listeners did, did not want to hear women, quite the opposite. They didn't they did want to hear women. Uh, and so the demand that was represented as something that represents the whole of the ultra orthodox sector turned out um, not, not to be true because most people were not for it. Um, the last example I wanted to give you on this issue of gender segregation is our fight against modesty signs uh, in several cities in Israel, which have a, a large ultra orthodox population. There are signs, huge signs hung on the streets uh, asking women to dress in a specific manner. Uh, and also some of the signs sometimes uh, ask women not to stand next to an entrance to a synagogue or a shiva. Uh, we have uh, represented for the last decade a group of very brave Orthodox women who live in the city of Beit Shemesh in central Israel, a city which is about half ultra-Orthodox and the other half uh, secular and um, Masorti and modern Orthodox. Um, and they have been subject to violence because uh, the, the radicals who attacked them s s thought they did not were not dressed modestly enough, although they are Orthodox women. And we've had a series of legal procedures representing them in courts uh, and won each and every one of those struggles. Uh, the court ordered the municipality to take down the signs. And indeed, some of the signs has been taken down. Some of them were put up again. It's a very long, long struggle, but it was clear that the court kept saying that those signs are illegal uh, because they convey a message of humiliation toward women, of seeing a woman as a sexual object that should be restricted when walking around a public street. So those are just a few examples of the issues we've been dealing with, uh, with on the issue of exclusion of women and gender segregation. Uh, in some areas, we see a major improvement. In some areas, we still have a lot to fight uh, still. Um, another issue I wanted to talk to you about is the issue uh, of fighting racism. IROC has been leading the fight against racism and specifically against incitement to racism, especially incitement which is voiced by rabbis or based on Jewish resources. So we go against people who use the Jewish religion to incite hatred and violence, uh, especially when we're talking about people who are in formal posts uh, for instance, rabbis who are part of the civil service and the state is paying the, their salary. And one of the examples is Rabbi Shmuel Eliyahu. He's a very prominent uh, rabbi who is the rabbi of Safed, a city up in northern Israel, uh, that is employed, who is employed by the state. We are paying his salary. And he has been using his post for many years now to incite mostly against Arabs, calling them to be uh, people not to rent houses uh, in Safed, where he uh, um, resides, uh, not to rent uh, um, houses to Arabs, not to allow them to study in the university there, uh, portraying all Arabs as criminals, uh, as murderers, as violent people, really horrible and racist remarks. He's had some uh, remarks against the LGBTQ com community, uh, also against women who uh, serve in the army, uh, some very um, uh, anti-women uh, remarks. Um, and we have been complaining uh, against him for many years. Um, last uh, year, in 2020, we um, reached uh, a legal victory when the Supreme Court ordered the Justice Ministry to initiate disciplinary proceedings against Rabbi Eli Eliyahu um, and actually marking the red line as to you know, which uh, speech is allowed to a rabbi who serves in formal posts and which speech is not allowed because of his role. Uh, and we've been following uh, to make sure that he, he would be under disciplinary proceedings. Uh, unfortunately, he continues to incite. And uh, actually today we sent a letter asking um, the attorney general to indict him because in Israel, incitement to racism is a criminal offense. 
so we believe that he's also he's, he should also stand to trial on his horrible remarks. Um, another uh, organization which we um, identified as a very dangerous organization is called Lehava. This is an organization whose stated goal is to fight assimilation, but actually it's just a pretense for violence uh, against Arabs and against mixed couples of Jewish women and Arab men. Um, and they have been um, active for the past decade or so, um, really um, initiating some horrible violence, violent activities against Arabs, mostly in central Jerusalem, but also elsewhere. Uh, in the riots that uh, happened in Israel uh, last May, uh, in mixed cities, in mixed Jewish Arab cities, they took a major part in uh, initiating the violence and the incitement. We've been following this organization and the person who heads the organization, uh, his name is uh, Ben Zion Gopstein. Uh, and after uh, a series of legal uh, petitions that we filed to the Supreme Court, the Attorney General finally indicted uh, Gopstein, the head of the organization, a couple of years ago, and he's now standing um, to trial on the issues of incitement to racism and violence. We also worked uh, against different platforms which uh, they use to uh, disseminate their incitement. Um, and some of those platforms were closed, were blocked. Uh, Facebook closed their account. A couple of years ago, Twitter um, blocked their account as well. And so we tried to uh, work in you know, different contexts to make sure they're not able to continue to disseminate their uh, incitement. Um, Gopstein is also the head of one of the racist parties, political parties in Israel called Jewish Strength, Otsma Yehudit. Uh, alongside uh, a few other leaders, uh, Michael Ben-Ari, Baruch Marzel, and Itamar Ben-Gvir. Those four uh, people are, uh, see themselves as the followers of Rabbi Meir Kahana, who was the race, a racist rabbi who was once um, a member of the Knesset and was disqualified. And in Israel, under Israeli law, one can be disqualified from running to the Knesset uh, if he incites to racism. But since Kahana was disqualified in the 1990s, 30 years ago, nobody managed to disqualify any other candidates because the court said that you have to bring a very strong body of evidence in order for the court to, to say that someone is not allowed to run for election. Uh, and we decided we were going to do it. So two, uh, three years ago, and in 2019, we had a series of uh, election uh, uh, systems uh, in the past few years, but in 2019, we managed to disqualify three of the four leaders of the Jewish Strength Party. Um, and it was quite, uh, qu quite a mission because we had to go through a lot of incitement, a lot of very uh, difficult material that we were exposed to for many weeks. Um, but we managed to create this body of evidence and to convince the attorney general and then the court to disqualify those candidates. And it was a, a very strong message that uh, shows that in the Israeli parliament, you, don't, uh, you cannot allow such racist views. And we are very proud of this achievement. Um, before um, turning to Anat, I wanna um, mention, um, of course, our struggle for freedom of religion. Um, and for equality of the reform movement and its congregations around the country. Uh, we have a lot of struggles going on uh, to break the orthodox monopoly and to ensure, ensure equal treatment by the state to the movement. And in this, this regard as well, we've had a series of um, legal victories. The state has started to fund uh, in part some of, of our rabbis, uh, some of our synagogue buildings, the construction of synagogue buildings, uh, we've had uh, a victory on the issue of conversion. Last March, the Supreme Court decided that reform conversion uh, performed in Israel will entitle the convert to a citizenship under the law of return. Um, and we have a lot of uh, other victories representing different congregations around Israel in their fight for land allocation, for budgets from the municipalities in each and every one of those requires almost each of one of those requires a legal struggle. Uh, I can tell you that now, because we have a new government for the past six months, we have a lot of um, um, good news and a lot of opportunities for change. Um, Gilad Kariv, who was the CEO of the reform movement, is now a member of the Knesset and he's the head of the uh, Constitution Committee. I think he spoke uh, before, uh, before this panel. 
And um, we have now, um, uh, we're working toward receiving more governmental funds to the reform movement, and also to create a mechanism which will ensure the continued funding of the reform movement in an equal manner uh, for years to come, even after this government would be dismantled. So it's a rare opportunity for us to bring about a, a major change on religion and state issues, and we're working very hard to make sure this change is actually going to happen. Um, so that's for the introductory part. I would be very happy to answer questions uh, after Anat. Wow. You see, uh, disguised as a mild-mannered lawyer, uh, she fights the never-ending battle for truth, justice, and the Jewish way in Israel. Uh, just a minute about the numbers. Oli, is, uh, Oli and her team are in court, give or take, 60 times a year. That's more than once a week. Don't call us, we'll sue you. That kind of a load. Uh, and some of the cases that you just gleaned by are cases that the lawyers among you would relish to hear how she won, for example, that million jacket with the radio station. We had no clients. This was a class action suit without clients. We actually used a pollster to show that women want to be heard on that radio. Unbelievable. A class action suit without, without clients. So um, I'm just thinking that you're sitting over there and you're thinking, what's happening there in the Jewish state? This is just so misguided. How could there be racism and, and discrimination against women and discrimination against the reform movement? And what's gone wrong in the Jewish state? So first, let me point out that we are mm, professors to um, warts on Israel's butt. I'm being polite. So we are focusing on one of the areas where Israel is broken and Israel needs mending. We are not sharing with you the great achievements of Israel because this is not what this webinar is, webinar is about. It's about what is the reform, do, what the, we as the reform movement, what are we doing to give Israel the greatest gift of mending its flaws, of tikkun, of fixing it? And I have one question to ask you. <laughs> Why are you quiet? I think that you've been quiet long enough. North American Jews were told by well-meaning Israelis that the best patriotic act that they can do for Israel is to keep their mouth shut. I want to uh, declare in Orly's name and in mine, you've been silent long enough. No one can push you away from the table where Jewish values are discussed. Israel affects every Jew around the world and reflects on every Jew around the world. Israelis can't tell North American Jews to stay, uh, to be uh, spectators on this. Zionism is not a spectator sport. It's one of participation. And it's probably the most exciting Jewish project of our lifetime to take part in making the Jewish state live up to its own dream. And Orly here is, is our hero in that she's, she's making the courts uh, live up to that dream. And uh, what makes Orly tick is the fact that we represent not just the reformed Jews of Israel, but we believe that we are the voice of reformed Judaism worldwide in Israel. I wanted to share with you one wart that I, <laughs> that I spent a lifetime trying to fix, and that is the issue of the Kotel, the wall in Jerusalem. As you know, Jerusalem is the holiest city in, in Israel and, and is the holiest city for the Jewish people. And inside Jerusalem, there is a wall where Jews come to pray and put notes in it, asking God for different things. And the wall has a plaza right in front of it. And it is divided unevenly between men and women. Men have 48 meters, women have 12. 
uh, don't feel guilty that you are men and you can enjoy a bigger a bigger section of the wall. You had nothing to do with the decision. It was completely political to make women have a smaller area. But it's not just that we have a smaller area there. We're also, until recently, we're not allowed to do the regular things that Jews do. It was, until recently, illegal for a woman to wear a talis, to wear a prayer shawl. It was illegal for a woman to say Shema Yisrael, to pray out loud. It was illegal for a woman to put on phylacteries, and sadly, it is still illegal for a woman to read from the Torah, and in fact, hold the Torah in her arms. All this falls under a regulation of the law of holy places, Obviously, there is a law of holy places. It's quite old. It's from King George V uh, from 1924. And it's, state, you know, obvious stuff. You're not to piss on the wall, no graffiti on the wall, no uh, slaughtering of animals at the wall, no begging at the wall. Hmm. And there is the 13th regulation. One cannot perform a religious act contrary to local custom which offends the feelings of others. Anybody performing such an act, six months imprisonment. I believe that this uh, regulation is a blemish on Israel's law books, and I have made it my personal business <laughs> to challenge that regulation whenever I can. And therefore I have a criminal record for having performed a religious act contrary to local custom. I'm very proud to have sat in our local uh, um, detention center in Jerusalem for inciting young girls to have a bat mitzvah, for reading Torah, for saying Shema Yisrael at the Hadassah conference when Hadassah was 120 years old. <laughs> the police actually came and arrested the woman who welcomed the women to the wall and said uh, uh, the, the the blessing of welcoming them to Israel. So um, here is where the women of the wall meet with Orly, because Orly is the lawyer for women of the wall. And uh, we are now very focused on trying to get, to make it legal for women to read Torah. Just so you know, every new month, hundreds of women come to the wall to pray with the women of the wall. That's the wow part of this presentation, Women of the Wall. And uh, among those women, there is always a bat mitzvah girl of sometimes young, sometimes an 83 year old bat mitzvah girl. And uh, many times we are unable to provide her with a Torah scroll so she could read the portion from the Torah, which is, you know, an integral part of having a bat mitzvah because the Torah was confiscated from our arms by a, an Israeli policeman. We go through body searches when we come to the wall and they're looking for a Torah. <laughs> Could you imagine that, that a Jewish policeman stands at the wall early morning and his one aim in life is to make sure that women don't read from the Torah. I find it incredible and I think that my colleagues in this struggle are listening to me right now. It is men from North America and of course women too, but for sure you are our partners and I extend my hand to you. I think it's exciting, it's fun, and it's very meaningful to fight to mend what happened to Judaism in Israel by giving the ultra-Orthodox a total monopoly over everything religious. The state of Israel has done a terrible wrong, first and foremost, to ultra-Orthodoxy, because when you become a monopoly, you become corrupt. Second, it's a terrible crime towards Judaism, because Judaism has, as you know, many, many flavors. And in Israel, sadly, the state recognizes basically only one, and that's stints, lively dialogue and discussion and kills pluralism. And third, it is terrible for Judaism that the largest Jewish community in the world, the fastest growing Jewish community in the world adheres to only one 
product on the shelf. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know how many of the 110 participants in this are Israelis. I would venture that they're very few. But you all know Israelis. They live next to you. They work next to you. You do business with Israelis. Do you know that Israelis in North America assimilate twice as fast than North American Jews? And God knows North American Jews do assimilate fast. So why are the Israelis never coming to shul? Why are they assimilating so fast? Why are they so ignorant? Ah, you don't think they're ignorant. Because they pronounce chet and resh correctly? Let me let you in in a secret. Speaking perfect Hebrew does not a Jew make. I have met some perfect, some people who speak perfect Hebrew who are not Jewish at all. And I sadly met many people who speak perfect Hebrew who know very little about their Judaism and about their Jewish identity. Tragically, Israelis are very arrogant and they think that even though they are not very versed in Judaism, they are super Jews. They're not. I, am, I went through a humbling experience when I went to America thinking that I'm a super Jew and I quickly learned about the marvelous diversity of Judaism in America and realized I'm an ignorant idiot. <laughs> it was in America that my eyes were open to the fact that there are so many ways to be Jewish, certainly more than one way to be Jewish. You know, I have a sticker on my car that says there's more than one way to be Jewish. And occasionally people take the air out of my tires because in Israel, to say that there is more than one way to be Jewish is a subversive statement. So I'll end here. And I'd love to hear your questions because you see Orly and I heard ourselves before and we're dying to have a dialogue with you. So please. Thank you. Thank you. So many questions. The first, just a, a little personal reflection. Uh, a short time ago, I had the opportunity to speak with the Deputy Consul General here in New York, Israel Nitzan. My question to him was, why are the Israeli police not doing, or seemingly not doing anything to prevent the violence on Rosh Chodesh when you go to pray at the Kotel. And he said that he thought they were doing better. I would suggest that you probably will disabuse us of that notion, but has there been any change with the new government? So uh, let me start and say why I think they are not protecting us. And I want Orly to really talk about what she is, she's crafting a new reality. So she'll talk about the changes with the new government, okay? But I'll say why not. Uh, after 33 years of getting to know the police at the wall, I can tell you that they don't see a hate crime when it is performed in front of them. In June this year, on the 11th of June this year, uh, 20, uh, 2021, a mob of young people took away the suitcase of Women of the Wall and de demolished and destroyed and tore to pieces 39 prayer books. There were 150 ushers, police and guards on the spot right there. Nobody was detained. Now, you should know that this is a criminal act to destroy a, a prayer book in public in order to humiliate a person is a crime. And yet nobody was detained. And when I turned to these police and asked why not, it turns out that they didn't see it as a hate crime. They would have seen it as a hate crime if the mob was Arab. But since it was religious Jews, they actually saw it as an expression of zealotry and of deep religious feeling. That's one reason. The second reason is that the rabbi of the wall uh, developed 
informal relations with each and every one of the policemen and guards. On Hanukkah, they get a donut from him. On Purim, they get a hamantashen. There's always this inform where they need a bar mitzvah services. Of course, he's there for them. They're there together to every day, all men and all, there's nothing wrong with men being together. We are now men together, but I'm just saying, uh, they developed a little subculture of us against those provocative women who come here to disturb the peace and do these actions that wouldn't it be better if they did it at home with the door closed and not disturbed us at the wall? Basically, that's it. Oli, what's waiting for us in the future? I want to say that basically the we did have a meeting with the new internal security minister who seemed to declare its intention to change the, the really horrible violent situation at the wall. But unfortunately, uh, as Anat said, we have the ushers of the Kotel Heritage Foundation and they're the ones who declare what is going on in the wall. And they're very hostile towards women of the wall and they really don't do anything uh, to prevent all the harassment and the violence. Uh, and what the police is doing at most is only creating a barrier between women of the wall and between the people who try to be violent against them, both women inside the women's section and men at the upper plaza and when entering and exiting the wall. So it's not a real solution. Nobody is detained. Nobody's, um, you know, if someone screams or pushes or, or spits upon, nobody does anything to them. So, you know, the next month it's just going to be the same because they understand nobody does anything. So why the violence continues? So we don't really detect a real change in policy. Uh, just a minimum um, effort to try to keep the part, you know, different parties apart. Um, I, I see that uh, we have a few questions here uh, about the uh, issue of implementation of the of the Kotel. So, Stephen, if, if it's okay, I, I, I may address it. Um, I, I can tell you that we're putting a lot of energy um, toward the new government in trying to um, bring the Kotel agreement uh, up again. Uh, I can tell you that we have uh, now a discourse with the government, which is something we didn't have uh, for the past six years. So this is, you know, this is good news. We are meeting with the cabinet secretary. We've, we've had two meetings with him. We're going to meet him on a monthly basis. Um, he didn't promise anything. It's, it's clear that it's not something that is going uh, to happen very quickly. Uh, but I think it's really important for all of us, both in Israel, and uh, overseas um, to put pressure on the government and to really uh, voice a very um, clear voice saying, this is the opportunity that we've, we've been waiting for. We waited for so many years after the agreement has been frozen in 2016. This is now the time to revive it, to put it back on the table. I think the uh, federations of North America have an important role here. I think the different Jewish organizations, whether it's APAC or other organizations have a critical role. So if any of you is involved with those organizations, it's important that those voices would come from as, as many sources as possible. Uh, because I think for many years, we have been you know, the good kids standing aside, being very quiet and just waiting for things to happen. But the other side is not sitting aside quiet. They are inciting against the reform movement, against women of the wall. They're threatening the government that ultra orthodox would come, hundreds of thousands of ultra orthodox would come to the wall if the Kotel agreement would be implemented. And it's very, I think it's critical for us to voice the other voice saying, we want compromise. We don't want the whole Kotel for ourselves. We, you know, the ultra orthodox would have their part, but we would have our respectable egalitarian plaza, which we do not have today. It's, it's uh, important to stress that in the egalitarian plaza today, you cannot touch the wall since uh, a huge uh, stone fell from the wall at the egalitarian plaza in 2018. So three and a half years, there is no access to the wall. The whole place is inaccessible for people in wheelchairs. Uh, we don't have received budgets. We don't have any influence on how the, the, the place is managed. 
and really there are no uh, clear rules as to what is allowed and what is not allowed. So you have ultra-Orthodox people coming to the egalitarian plaza and putting a mechitza and having a segregated prayer there. So it's not enough that they have the whole big segregated plaza, but they're coming and trying to take control of the egalitarian plaza. So I think it's very important for ev all, of, all of us uh, to pressure the government and to tell them this is this is the time we've been waiting for you said you're going to be a government of change let's change the situation at the Kotel and really bring about peace and making it a place where there is more than one way to be Jewish thank you I I know that you can see the the Q and A um so I think one of the interesting ones is where and how did the ultra-Orthodox discrimination against women originate? And I think perhaps a, a little bit of history when, when Ben-Gurion was establishing the government might be in order to help clarify that. Um, I think uh, we, we trace the, the demand for gender segregation uh, to about 20 years ago when um, uh, in the ultra-Orthodox uh, typical family, uh, the men study in the yeshiva their whole life, and the women are the ones who provide for the families and go all around and about and basically know what's going on in the world. Uh, and in this, this sense, the role of women has become very important in the ultra-Orthodox world. And th this was a way of the political leaders of the ultra-Orthodox to send a message to women, listen, you might be you know, providing for the family, but you have to know your place. Your place is the back of the bus. Uh, I think it was also a reaction toward the growing liberalization of Israeli society. Israel has become more and more modern and liberal. And the ultra-Orthodox said, okay, how are we going to continue to um, uh, maintain our specific uh, nature? We're going to uh, close ourselves within our walls and uh, make sure that whenever we go out to the public sphere, we're going to make it our own. We're going to uh, uh, force segregation in order for it to be ultra-Orthodox. And um, for many years, the government said, okay, that's what the ultra-Orthodox want. That's what we have to give them. You know, we are a multicultural society. We have to respect this demand. Uh, and it took time to convey the message that within the ultra-Orthodox sector, we have many voices. Usually you hear just the radical ones. Usually you hear just the voices of men because women cannot decide what are the norms within the ultra-Orthodoxy. They cannot change the norms. They have to abide by the rules that men created for them. And so uh, it's very interesting to know that this trend has changed. And now we have uh, feminist ultra-Orthodox groups of women who are really, really bravely try to change the reality that you know ultra orthodox parties do not have any female representatives there they're trying to fight different uh, sexual harassment issues within the ultra orthodoxy um but this is a very interesting process that we've been going through for the past decade and i think iraq has been a, a clear um engine in showing the government we have more voices and the government must respect all women both ultra orthodox and elsewhere and do not allow those uh, humiliating practices in the public sphere. I want to add just one thing, and that is just something about law and order when it comes to ultra-Orthodox violence. 20 minutes ago, a store in Geula, Geula is a neighborhood in ultra-Orthodox Jeru in Jerusalem, a store that sells uh, phones, cellular phones, but they're also selling regular selling uh, uh, cellular phones, not just kosher phones. Kosher phones are phones where you cannot see pornography, no internet, because like uh, the old American uh, musical, The Music Man, you shouldn't have a pool because it starts with a P and that rhymes with a T and that spells trouble. That kind of cognitive leaping is what goes on in the ultra-Orthodox world in that if you have a regular phone, you will immediately go to prostitutes and consume drugs. That's a fact. And that's why you must use a kosher phone. 
anyway, this store <coughs> was sell is selling regular phones as well as kosher phones. It's about to be set afire. It says here, this happened just 20 minutes ago, that the police is unable to contain this, this uh, demonstration. Hundreds of people are surrounding the store, threatening to burn it down. We're looking at a very condensed neighborhood. Burning that store would mean burning the building and the police is unable to contain it. Why? If these were Arabs, I assure you, the police has all the instruments and the capacities to stop this demonstration. But when it comes to the ultra-Orthodox, there is a hesitation because this act of violence is seen as an expression of religious fervor. That's the problem. And just a minute, if I'm talking about kosher phones, I can't not invite Orly to say something about what she does about kosher phones. <laughs> Uh, so we uh, filed a petition um, last summer on the issue of kosher phones because it turns out that there is a body called the uh, Rabbinical Committee on the Issue of Communication, which basically um, has control over um, half a million uh, phones, uh, kosher phones, and they can decide from those kosher phones which numbers you can call and which numbers you're not allowed to call. So it's not only not giving you access to the internet, but it's also um, if you know the committee is uh, angry about some organizations in the ultra orthodox world, then they say, okay, today I'm shutting this down and you can't call this store or this business just because I feel like it. Nobody really has any uh, supervision on the issue and they have been using uh, this uh, tremendous force arbitrarily. Uh, we've we, we he heard a lot of voices within the old Orthodox community calling against the power of this committee, uh, and that's why we filed um, a petition. Could you, with, uh, could you mention with, what numbers are missing, for example? So, so the blocked numbers could be the numbers of um, uh, hotlines for people who were sexually harassed, uh, of uh, the the red the the the. Um, red alert, uh, if you have a missile attack, uh, then you can hear it over the phone, it was blocked. Uh, they were mad about the communication ministry. So the, um, the line of the communication ministry, the government ministry was blocked just because they felt like it. And during COVID, uh, they were different lines that through them students, um, you know, basically studied, uh, they blocked those lines as well. So it was really, unbelievable amount of uh, um, lines that were blocked. We filed a petition on behalf of uh, a few LGBTQ organizations that were, their hotlines were blocked. Uh, and they, they said that basically ultra-Orthodox people who wanted mental assistance and tried to call them could not do so. And this of course was put them in grave danger because they were under uh, great mental distress. So this is basically another issue, issue that we identified as something that is totally uncontrolled. Uh, the Ministry of Communi Communication didn't do anything. The phone, um, uh, the cellular companies, of course, had a lot of uh, uh, economical interests to allow it. And so uh, we stepped in and actually the communication minister is now um, starting to supervise the issue and to uh, restrict some of the actions that this committee has been um, doing. Um, Orly, you recently had an article published in Haaretz about, um, we, we spoke about this when, when we were doing our little practice about women's faces uh, being a threat to faith and health. And uh, for those of our attending our webinar that might not be familiar with this, could you discuss that a little bit? Sure. So uh, two other trends that we've been we've identified on the issue of exclusion of women are trends relating to the um, uh, trying to um, basically not show any female images at all. And it happens in two ways. The first one is that when you have billboards that show images of women, they are vandalized, uh, torn and sprayed upon. Um, this has been going on, especially in Jerusalem. 
And the other trend is that um, bodies and organizations and businesses censor themselves in advance and do not show female images at all because they're afraid that those images will be vandalized by ultra-orthodox radicals. Uh, and the, the op-ed I wrote in Aris uh, basically recounted my personal experience on those two contexts. So uh, we had um, a meeting with the president of Israel on the issue of the Kotel two months ago. Uh, and uh, a picture of the meeting was published in an ultra-Orthodox uh, internet site. But all the faces of the women were blurred so as not to show uh, the faces. Of course, the men were shown you know, full-faced. Uh, and it was actually the first time that I, after fighting this trend for many years, I experienced it on a personal level. And it was really, it made me so angry. Um, the fact that they take your face and then they blur it because God forbid you can't show a face of a woman on an internet site was really unbelievable. We wrote this, the internet site a letter and we're uh, going to file um a civil suit for damages on behalf of me and my fellow female, uh, the CEO of the reform movement, Anna Kislansky, and the CEO of the conservative movement uh, and heads of Women of the Wall. So we're, we're, we're going to fight. We're not going to give up on this really infuriating phenomena. And the other one is that um, I started to go on a physical therapy treatment in my health clinic uh, in Jerusalem, in two health clinics. And in all of, in those clinics, all of those signs you have really big signs uh, spread around the clinic. And all of those signs show men, boys, uh, and baby boys only. And you don't see any female Im images at all. Um, and we have been dealing with this for, for many years now. Uh, we had the Ministry of Health telling the health clinic, this is illegal and any publication should show men and women. Uh, but it didn't change the way they work. And it was like, the, again, the first time I experienced on this personal level, level I came to get uh, a medical treatment and I kept just seeing all the male images and it drove me crazy. And instead of female images, they actually put signs with um, a pair uh, and some, uh, you know, different objects uh, in order not to show uh, women at all. So this is, um, I, I, we also are going to file a civil suit against this health clinic because it seems that unless people are trying, starting to pay uh, for their illegal actions, they would not stop doing so. So this is, uh, this was quite, quite an experience really feeling it on a personal level, which really just made me even more and more eager to fight um, th those phenomena. And we have a, in the Q&A from Rabbi Brad Boxman, that I find very interesting. He says, we recognize that we as Jews in the diaspora have a vital role in raising our voices. What is the IMPJ in Iraq doing to gain support of Israeli citizens? Um, it yeah, very important point. Uh, I can tell you that most of the issues we have, are dealing with and enjoy uh, a tremendous uh, support from the Israeli public across, you know, different party lines and religious lines, uh, different religions. Most Israelis want, uh, you know, Israel to be a more pluralistic state. They want equality for the reform movement. They want a solution at the Western Wall. Uh, they want to have public transportation on Shabbat and freedom of choice in marriage. They want to have civil marriage. Uh, it's just that usually the politicians just block it. I think the problem is that when Israelis go to vote, they usually would not vote specifically on issues of religion and state. They would vote on issues of security or the economy. And so sometimes it doesn't translate into a political change. I think the current government um, show, shows that most Israelis do want uh, solutions of compromise and really to trying to bring about change on specific issues of religion and state. I think that we might reach achieve, um, you know, different achievements on issues of public transportation on Shabbat. Um, we had a reform on the issue of uh, uh, Kashrut, which we had a part in, in a, a legal victory we had a few years ago. Um, they're trying to deal with the issue of conversion. So I think this government tries to translate the popular support in changing the issue of religion state in Israel to really bring about change. It won't, you know, because it's a complex coalition, it won't happen in all of the areas. We're not going to see civil marriage anytime soon, 
but at least you can see that there is the voice of reason, the voice of compromise that most Israelis support. Uh, I'd like to add to Rabbi Boxman, as well as many other of our supporters, you have relatives in Israel and friends in Israel, and you can influence Israelis as well. You are, if North American Jews took upon themselves to make their voice heard, someone like Tad Schwab, who's listening to us right now, who writes week, maybe twice a week, to the Council General of Israel in Miami, or you, Stephen, that you went to the Council General in, in, in New York. These are very important steps. First, these politicians eventually become politicians in Israel, and you influence and change them. But most importantly, you also uh, influence what Israelis think. Look at, uh, if you look at the issue of conversion, you know that every ultra-Orthodox party in Israel, in its platform, swears to Almighty God that they will knock the uh, part in the law of return that allows conversions other than Orthodox. They will knock it out. And why have they not done it? They've been in power for so many years, they've not done it. You know why? Because whenever they attempt to do it, North American Jews jump out of their skin, missions come to Israel, who's a Jew again, and they don't allow it to happen. I'd like you just to widen, widen the menu, not just conversion. There are some other issues that you can voice, you, you can just cry and say, this is not the Israel I was hoping for. These are not the Jewish values I believe in. And your voice is mighty and important. And I'm just saying the sleeping giant has to wake up because, because otherwise you may wake up one day and see an Israel that you cannot identify with. And we share this uh, concern and that worry. And we believe it is within our power to make Israel be exactly what we want it to be. The Disneyland of the Jews, the club meant for the Jewish soul. <laughs> it could be as they're burning that store you know sign up to our newsletter if you are not signed on so far it's going to be up in the chat in one minute uh, the address of how to sign up to Iraq and uh, it will be there hopefully and uh, that uh, we will let you know what happened to that store the police right now in the fire department is unable to contain that demonstration. We will tell you what's going on on these issues, which are very important and where you can influence and change. So other than signing up to the newsletter, contacting the consulates in various areas, and we have, uh, we have people from across North America, not just the United States on, on this webinar, what other specific acts do you think we could take to help you? Specifically, since this is a, in, an MRJ webinar, what can we as men do to help women of the wall? What can we do to help Iraq, IMPJ, so uh, let's do it this way. I will say one, Orly will say another, and we will uh, entertain you uh, in giving you many ideas. So the one I would say is, when you visit Israel, time your visit around Rosh Chodesh. It's famous, it's in every Jewish calendar. Find out when the new month begins and join the women of the wall. As a man, join the women of the wall. You give us tremendous support and it will be the highlight of your visit to Israel. I would say uh, other than signing up for a newsletter, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, uh, get to know what we're doing and tell others so they'll they'll know uh, you know all of the issues we're dealing with. I want to add that you should in your philanthropy, Ask yourself before you give some organization in Israel, is this an organization which Israel's government is supporting? 
Why is that important? Israel is the 18th largest economy in the world. We, the Israelis, are the largest donors to our own budget. We support our defense ministry to the tune of 55 billion shekel. We support education, we support health, we support a lot, of, and it's right that we should do that because this is our state. But there are things that the Israeli government not only doesn't support, the Israeli government actually causes them to be depleted. One of such organization is our own reform movement. There's a lot of government money going to Orthodox institutions, altogether around $1 billion going to Orthodox institutions. And with great you know, uh, courage and work at the courts, we are around 20 million, 25 million shekel between the reform and conservative movement combined. So 20, 25 million is, 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 sounds a lot, but compared to $1 billion, it's not. So I think philanthropy should also reflect your values. Uh, and I can add, um, if you want to invite, um, invite us to talk uh, to your congregation, uh, we don't know when we're going to be able to come physically. We hope we will be able, but you know, Zoom opens up you know, possibilities. So we'd be happy to talk um, on whatever issues we're dealing with. Um, and to get more and more people involved and engaged. Okay, and if you get pissed off with something and something really upsets you, don't keep it in your belly. Call us, tell us, and we'll tell you what can be done about it, what we are doing about it, what organizations that we know and close to do about it. Talk to us. I think that working with Israelis on mending Israel is probably one of the positive activities you could do uh, in this lifetime. And I extend a, a really a very uh, welcoming hand. I know some of the people on this webinar and the reason I know them well is that they call and they tell me, oh, I read this and that bothers me no end. Share that, I, I love complainers. I think on that, I'm just going to ask both of you for any closing remarks you might like to make, um, including, of course, where uh, people who are listening um, could choose to donate if they feel. So, yeah, we, we have, um, I also posted it on, in answer to one of the questions uh, on IREC's website. We have um, a support IRAC, and we're, of course, uh, welcoming any support you might lend us. Um, we see you as partners in our struggle to make Israel um, a more just society and to mending the injustices that we feel are not only undemocratic, but are also uh, not Jewish. Uh, and we would be happy to um, go hand in hand with you, with your support to continue to do uh, all the wonderful stuff that you've heard about today and much more. I would like you to extend your hand and pat yourself on the shoulder. This is not at all trivial that you chose a webinar with two women. You are after all men of reform Judaism, that the two women are Israelis, that these two women are in court and in combat weekly and that you were willing to bravely look at some of the underside of Israel and still love it. Uh, this is many years of marriage speaking. I think love is what remains after we know the truth. And I salute MRJ for being willing to hear some hard truths about Israel and know that your members still love Israel. As you love America, and God knows, there's some warts on America's behind. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to touch that line. <laughs> but I, in, in closing, I, going back to Sfad, I'm not sure if you know, but I would say in a vast predominance of reform congregations, every Friday night, there is Lechad Odi. And 
to hear that Safad is one of the, the places that is with, with a rabbi that is promoting, for lack of a better term, and I don't like to use the word hate, um, a lesson I learned from the rabbi of um, Tree of Life. I, I try never to use that word, but um, to hear that is, is, is disheartening, but in a way I find it enabling because I think it points to that we here in the diaspora have to speak up. We have to make our voices heard. Um, Israel is, is a country that I think everybody that's on this call um, holds dear to their heart. And I really do want to thank both of you for participating in this webinar. Um, I started by saying I hope people found it informative, educational, entertaining. And I, for one, have found it informative, educating, um, informational, and entertaining. And uh, thank you both for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night.